Um, continue. Let's do it. How do I? Can I? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yes, you can. Give me the power. Oh, sorry. Uh, to share now you screen. have the power. Now you have the power. All right, cool. So, anyways, um, ships. Just a little bit about myself. Uh, I left ETC Labs like last year to go on this crazy mythical startup journey. I told uh, Professor Zoro that I was going full node. I was going to run my <laughs> own like <laughs> blockchain. No, no Infura, no other services, just me. Um, so anyways, a while ago, I raised a little bit of grant money, raised some more grant money. And so I'm just like kind of going at it. Uh, and so what is ships? And in that cell, I'm just going to say it's the future and it's open source social clubs. Okay. All right. So where are we going today? So I wanted to do a blockchain technology overview. I wanted to go high level overview of financial systems in the space, kind of like what people are doing. And then finally, just a brief, like how does this all relate to ships? And then some blockchain tips and tricks, like what's out there, who's out there, what do I need to see? Uh, what should I just like go and explore? Where should I stake my money? Of course on ships. Um, <laughs> no, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, so just a quick like poll. How familiar are people with blockchain? Before I go into the, the rabbit hole. Karen, Yaren. Uh... Anyone who's taking the blockchain class? Yeah, yeah, we have we have a couple. We have like at least four people here who's taking a blockchain class. And pro well, yeah, but a uh, bunch of you are working on uh, blockchain projects. I guess it's who's not working is more like it. Um, ah, that's okay. So, that's okay, we'll but just, no, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Please, we're gonna move and groove because I know it's a short window of time. So I'm just gonna like <laughs> do it. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so um, what's the medium? All right, what are we talking about? We're talking about blockchain. There are a lot of different players in the space. Some of them are kind of crazy, like Dogecoin, which is built on Bitcoin. There's Near, which is like auto scaling um, for the blockchain. It's like at the edge is where Ethereum 2 wants to go. Um, there's Polygon. Um, you may have noticed that um, fees and transaction fees on the blockchain are like quite high. And so one sort of way around that is to think about uh, like, how can we do this on L2? So Polygon is an L2. And what L2 means is it's not the main uh, blockchain. It's not as secure, um, but it does mean it's lower fees. Uh, then of course we've got Ethereum. We've got, uh, actually, I'm just gonna, uh, can I do it in presentation? Uh, great, cool. So we've got, uh, let's minimize that. So we've got Ethereum, we've got Bitcoin, we've got Zcash, which is a privacy first um, sort of blockchain. So how can you have privacy in a blockchain? Zcash is the answer. Um, that uses this thing called ZK Snarks. We've got Binance Coin. What happens when an exchange decides to make its own blockchain? You get Binance, which is called BSC, which does a lot of volume and has really, really ridiculously low transaction fees. And then you have Stacks. So how can you build uh, a blockchain that has smart contracts like Ethereum and smart contracts to recap that are just kind of like programs that are run on the blockchain? Um, well, Stacks is the kind of answer to that. So this is kind of like a large swap of like players in the space that are pretty important and large players for various reasons. Okay, so what's the message? Okay, the message is here are the different kind of entities that are in the space. We have DAOs, which are called uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, which people tend to use for governance structure. So for instance, Maker is run by MakerDAO. Um, okay, and Maker is like a stable coin. We'll get to that. Um, you have stable coins. Um, so how do you have currency um, that is backed by something that is not volatile? Uh, and so there are a couple different ways about that. You can do it with crypto, you can do it with uh, regular dollars. Then you have these things called LPs or liquidity pools. And so liquidity pools are just uh, a way for people to pull uh, money together and provide liquidity to the market. So how do you market make in a decentralized way? And then you have these things called yield farming, uh, which people use to uh, incentivize people to loan out their money. And then part of LPs, and kind of yield farming is this autom 
Matic uh, market maker, AMMs. Uh, and so AMMs are um, essentially smart contracts that allow you to sort of automatically set the price for what new issuances or what uh, like crypto is issued at. And then finally, the thing that everyone's been excited about and New York City and FTs is coming up and the Wu-Tang uh, album was purchased, presumably to be made into an NFT, are non-fungible tokens. So how do you have like an asset class or something that is like a one of one that is rare or a uniquely identifiable like sort of entity within the space? Okay, so now uh, we'll just kind of deep dive into what all these things are. Stable coins, what goes in the crypto stays in the crypto. So typically the way it works, you take a pool of cash, you say like, hey, I would like to register this pool of cash with a trust. Here's the trust in the back. And in the front, you have a smart contract that tracks how much money is going in and out of the trust. And what you do for every $1 that's in here, you issue out a coin. And this coin, it could be any of these, um, they all kind of work similarly, where there's like either a New York trust, it could be a Chicago-based trust, um, and money just kind of sits here. It can earn interest in theory, but it is regulated by the Fed uh, in terms of how that works. And sometimes what these uh, companies do on the front end is they'll charge a fee for either converting these tokens into actual fiat, or they'll charge a fee on the ingress. So when fiat is uh, going into the trust itself. Uh, and then an alternative to this is to try and build an all crypto stable coin. So you may have heard of this cryptocurrency called DAI. And so what DAI does is it pulls together Ethereum and tries to use um, like leverage so you can, if you deposit so much Ethereum into uh, this thing that they call a vault, which is essentially like a personalized trust, um, then you can mint so much DAI. And so you can only pull out like three fourths of the value of Ethereum at the time that you put it in, uh, into DAI. And so they play a sort of economic game of pulling together DAI, and I believe they use TUSD or USDT to try and hedge and create uh, a sort of one-to-one -one, um, sort of stable coin uh, like currency. So you can trust DAI to be pegged more or less to the dollar. It's really quite fascinating. I would recommend that everyone reads the sort of MakerDAO uh, paper because that's kind of like the basis on how um, a lot of these other sort of like alt, all crypto stable coins and things like Curve and Yield, um, they all kind of took their inspiration from that. Okay, liquidity pools. Make the market, make bank. <laughs> How does that work? Okay, what is a liquidity pool? Um, liquidity pool is like basically a automatic market maker. Um, so you deposit two sets of tokens into a pool. A pool is just a smart contract. Um, and so, for instance, we'll say at the time I wrote this, this was 3,000 die <laughs> for like one ETH, more or less. Um, and so you have to hold the die, you hold the ETH, and you put this into the pool. So you put this in, you deposit it into the smart contract. And then the smart contract then sets the price for like sort of extracting that. So you get a whole bunch of people to basically create a whole bucket full of these currency pairs. And then when someone wants to buy a currency, they just go to the pool and buy it at the price um, that's set by the liquidity pool function. And so essentially what the liquidity pool tries to do is have a constant price function. So that way, um, when more uh, sort of like ETH in this case gets withdrawn, the price of the ETH uh, goes up in relation. So it, it will cost more DAI and I'll try and keep that ratio like pegged. Um, okay, so for why would you do this? Why would you provide liquidity in the market? So by providing liquidity in the market, you get a 
proportion of the transaction fees. Um, and so um, that kind of helps you gain interest on money or not, not money, it's not money, we'll say, a cryptocurrency that is just sitting there because like uh, money that's just sitting in a pal is not really doing you any good. You should be trying to earn interest uh, so that way it's just like, you know, not devaluing through sort of inflation. All right, so we talked a little bit about that, but like, what's the risk? Okay, so risk is, in this case, you have systemic risks, maybe something happens like fraud, you have regulatory risk, um, maybe the government says that like Uniswap is now a security and can't happen anymore. And then you have this other thing called impermanent loss. So remember how we were talking about how um, there tries to be like sort of a constant ratio for um, the price for the market. So let's say you put the 3000 die in the one ETH, right? Um, that price can only grow on the function of the liquidity pool. So maybe it, means that like when someone extracts like half an ETH or something, the, the price goes up to like 6,000 DAI in relation to the demand. But let's say that uh, elsewhere on the market, um, that the price is now 3,500 DAI per like one ETH. So what that means is like the price in the liquidity pool can't just suddenly jump to $3,500. It's got to like, walk along that function to increasing the price to where the price in the liquidity pool equals the market price. And so that gap, when there are large pricing swings, then you might not make as much as if you had just held the, the raw currency on the market. So when there's a lot of volatility in the market, you can suffer what people call impermanent loss. It's not actually permanent loss um, because you could make it back and it could have been that you've provided so much liquidity to the pool that you made more money than you would have if you had just held on to the asset during the appreciating like price part. But um, you do potentially so suffer a loss, loss. So Uniswap version V1 and V2 um, didn't really cover this much, but in V3, what they started to do is say like, okay, well, you can set the amount or you can set a limit for how much the price can swing before like you exit the pool. And so what you could do, um, and a lot of like people still don't like this because then it's a lot of active management, your money goes out, you gotta get, put it back in. Gas fees are really high. So you could start suffering losses um, just on the transaction fees for the volatility. So a lot of people just still like to let it ride. Um, yeah. Okay, and two large liquidity pools in the, the market. There's the Uniswap protocol, and then there's also like Sushi, um, which is just like kind of another one. Because we love memes, Sushi's like pretty fun. <laughs> and it's all centered around uh, Sushi's. Uh, so um, yield farming, what is this? You may have heard this um, floating around. Um, it's really a combination of stuff. So the basic premise is that if you have an apple and you convert that to avocados, you can then earn pretzels that earn dollars. So <laughs> it's about like sort of doing this idea of like what people funnily term rotating crops. So a lot of protocols have um, settings and setups that are kind of like die or um, loaning or lending practices. So Essentially, what they'll say is like, oh, if you deposit 1,000 ETH or 100 ETH and you let us loan this out to institution, institutional investors, um, so one of these is like Celsius um, Compound does the same sort of thing, then we will provide you with interest and uh, on your like money that you loaned out. And on top of that, we'll give you these kind of ideas of a reward token. The re reward token can be used for various things. It can cover things like gas fees. It can uh, use for like a rebate or a kickback of some sort. Um, and so what people have started to do is to look at the different protocols and look at the different like loaning uh, and lending rates. And also here's another crazy thing. 
they will pay you incentives for actually pulling out or uh, creating leverage on a particular platform. Okay, so that's kind of like the broad scope, but what people will do is they'll say like, okay, Compound will give you like 50 tokens uh, or like, I don't know, they'll give you 2% um, interest. Plus if you're borrowing, they'll give you so many of these rewards tokens that are worth on the market, like $10 or something. Okay, cool. So why don't I create a scheme where I'm borrowing from Compound and then I'm using the rewards from that to then uh, like, <laughs> to then fund or cover the interest from another platform. So it's like uh, basically bundling together these loaning and like borrowing rates to find uh, sort of an arbitrage situation where one loan covers the, the cost of another. Um, and you're able to then capitalize on that in some sort of way. And so people have been doing this uh, with like sort of curve and uh, yearn and like cream recently, which got creamed by by the uh, you know um, by uh, a hack that recently happened with sort of flash learning. Um, okay, so in a broad sense, it's uh, kind of like combining a bunch of credit swaps <laughs> or like. And these kind of short term, like, how do I find the right yield? And so like people have kind of started shying away from this as much um, because like I said, um, people have become more savvy, pricing information has become uh, like stronger. And so it's, it's like a, a cat and the mouse game. There's a new product called abracadabra.money, um, which is probably the most sophisticated of um, these kind of like yield farming schemes. Um, okay. And so like, what do you really suffer from this? So with all of these borrowing schemes, they kind of work like maker that we talked about earlier, where you have to keep a certain ratio or what happens is liquidation. So they will take all of your money. So let's say that um, I, let's say that one ETH, is worth uh, 3,000, well, it's hard. I have to think about it because it's like a 75% ratio um, that you have to maintain. But we'll say um, one ETH is worth 10,000 uh, DAI, right? And so at the time I put in one ETH into the bank or into the, the DAI vault or wherever I, this belongs. And then what happens is uh, that I can then withdraw uh, seventy-five percent of that in terms of die, so um, it issues me seven thousand five hundred die, and I'm happy about this. Let's say the price of ETH goes up, then that means that I can withdraw even more die. Let's say it goes up to twenty thousand uh, ETH. So now I'm able to leverage that as uh, so twenty thousand ETH or something like that. Then I can take out twenty percent of that. Uh, so it's like roughly 15,000 uh, die. So now I have 15,000 die on the market, but then what happens if the price falls? So if the price falls below um, say 75% threshold of that 15,000 die that I withdrew, then um, what that means is that I need to cover my assets. So I need to put money back in, I need to exchange the die for ETH to back the die that I just pulled out. And if I don't do that, then what happens is, is the contract will liquidate and just take the assets and I keep the die. So um, what you suffer for like borrowing is that the pricing movements could be volatile and like you could be liquidated. Your underlying asset, you could no longer like have access to. And because there is a ratio, there is some risk that uh, the underlying asset will be worth more than what you've actually redeemed. Okay, so who sets the rules for these systems? So this is like kind of, if we go back, 
<laughs> we're almost there. Stay with me. We've gone LPs, yield farming, stable right coins, right AMMs, and so now we're at the DAOs. Okay, who sets the rules for these systems? DAOs. So most of the governance for these things are DAOs. Part of that can be sometimes because of legal structure. Um, it's a kind of a murky area. Um, if there is no direct company that rules the protocols, um, but instead this like collection of individuals that have decided to buy into the system to independently vote and figure out things, then there is no like one company that's behind this, you know, there's like kind of no control. Um, there is kind of in the sense that the governance system is based on a vote and then the way that you may vote may be through tokens. So we'll just talk about briefly at a very high level uh, what this kind of looks like. So DAOs basically, uh, they set the rules via the token holder stake. So how many tokens you have for this particular ecosystem tends to be uh, how much you can affect the system. Uh, they're not owned by anyone. So there's no like DAO leader, so to speak. Um, uh, they're decentralized leadership with some rules around voting. So maybe you can only vote once a quarter. Maybe you can only make one proposal or maybe you even have to stake money for your vote. And then if you stake that money and people think that whatever you proposed was trash or not good for the system, then maybe you get slashed. And what that means is they take all your tokens uh, that you put up on that proposal. Um, and then the other thing to take note of is that it's not a security or a company. If there is no one entity that decides to mint tokens, or so I've been told, everything is new. It's like, it's a new legal, <laughs> legal murky area that people are figuring out. But so far, um, people that have followed these rules have not been um, slammed by the SEC. Um, and the SEC is, from my understanding, fairly happy with these as long as you're not telling people that tokens equal security and that you will get monetary rewards for well, any of these systems. Because value is, of course, inherently, whatever you make it. It could be calorie shells, it could be apples, it could be oranges, whatever, it's value. All right, so one thing that's not in the slide, that's just a thing to be aware of is this thing called MEV. Um, I touched about this like last year a little bit. Um, it's called minor extracted value. And so if we go back and we talk about how a blockchain works in today's uh, terms or in most of these um, systems. So proof of work, there are these people called miners. Miners run a lot of like, essentially small power plants. <laughs> um, they basically have to buy a lot of electricity to run a lot of machines to solve this cryptographic puzzle. And by solving this cryptographic puzzle, they get to decide what transactions are into that make the block. And so each transaction makes a block. Let's see. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, so each transaction makes a block. And so uh, what this means is just like, we've got transaction one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Um, but the miner decides what transactions like basically land on the blockchain. So there is a period like transactions are, that you make. So let's say you're gonna make a trade on um, like, I don't know, Binance. Let's say you're gonna make a trade on, yeah, let's say Binance. You make this trade on Binance for uh, one ETH at like, I don't know, $5,000. Cool. Uh, Binance goes and relays that to the blockchain. Uh, and then that transaction sits in this place called the pending pool. And then the pending pool has a bunch of transactions that are sort of sorted by priority. And you can pay a priority fee, which is called like gas. So, in theory, gas is supposed to dictate like how quickly your transaction lands. But the people that really tell you how fast a transaction lands are the miners, the people that like win the block. So one of the things that has started happening is that miners want to extract more value from the network. So uh, what they can do is order the transactions. So let's say that they see this transaction that you're making for one ETH for $5,000 on the market. And they are like, ah, that 5,000, I think I'm gonna snake them. 
I'm in a snake year. Uh, and so what that means is that they'll say, oh, I am just going to not include your transaction in the block that uh, I just won. And I'm going to include my transaction for 4,999, like die or whatever. Um, so uh, the miner actually has a lot of power. And so miners are kind of disincentivized to really do that in the sense that it's a lot to maintain and like manage. Um, and like techn technologically, they're sophisticated in the sense that they deal with hardware, but not really software. So what people have started to do, uh, like this protocol called Eden, is they have designed an economic incentive for the general public to talk to um, these people called mining pools. So miners tend to pool their resources together to solve the cryptographic puzzle. And so the people that participate in the mining pool don't really know what transactions actually get uh, accepted into the block. They just are computing their part of the puzzle. And then there's generally a centralized figure. Um, we'll call this guy or this person, the centralized figure. Um, and she will say like, yo, uh, this is not, uh, I want you to include, we're gonna include these transactions in the block. Um, and so what uh, she has learned here is that there is Eden protocol and all these other protocols that will pay her to order the transactions and the way that the people uh, want. And so they use tokens to basically uh, say like, hey, look, I have a transaction that I want. And I don't want to pay any kind of like high uh, rate and I want it to go in first. And so by holding this other set of tokens, it signals to this person that, okay, I'll include your transaction at this rate, which is a secondary market than what is like the proof of work gas market. And so you've seen this like play out in the NFT market and people do it in DeFi as well. It's just probably harder to, to detect. So if you absolutely need your transaction to go through, uh, using one of these protocols is to your advantage because then you get to have some sort of say as to when your transaction goes through, which is kind of nuts, but it's there, something to be aware of. Finally, finally, the coup d'etat. Um, NFTs, they're gonna only be one. So NFTs are non-fungible tokens. They are uh, sim simply a metaphor for like a unique asset. And so um, some of the things that people do is they have series, they're associated with art. Um, so in this case, we're talking about uh, on the left, Board Ape Yacht Club. And so what Board Apes does uh, is they're just an NFT with a series and really cool art. And they've kind of built a brand around it. Um, they have like sort of low IP uh, restrictions. So anyone that holds a board ape yacht can then like, you know, make some merch around it. They can market, they can build a smaller sort of economy around it. And so Board Ape Yacht Club has done over $200 million in sales. And these NFT projects are able to generate cash flows through royalties. So the royalties go um, back into the Board Ape Yacht Club DAO, a percentage, and some to uh, the actual core contributors. Now, DAO members are not able to directly compensate um, the like other members of the DAO, or that makes them a security. So they have to think about other ways to sort of add value. And so they've done that through like events, brand alignments, um, buying like rare uh, works of art, and and all kinds of interesting things that members then have like access to, they've also like started purchasing land in the metaverse. So it's really quite interesting. So the one in the middle is this uh, token called uh, Entities Multipass. And so what they're doing with NFTs is they're using this as a gateway to access software services. And so what they have is a platform for making NFTs and then uh, you mint this thing. And then what they do is they then say, hey, look, uh, for all of these NFT holders, we're going to give you a rewards token of some sort. Uh, and so they have started trying to figure out like what that economy looks like. And so there are other groups like CyberKongs um, and apes are just a kind of a thing, which is kind of interesting. 
And then finally, we go here to the thing that kind of started this whole sort of craze off, even though I've been in the blockchain space since 2017. So NFTs were around. I remember when CryptoPunks like launched. I was there for CryptoKitties. Um, but people like kind of inspired people to say, hey, wait a second here. The $69 million NFT was like, maybe there's some, some, some legs here. And so people started to, to think about like, oh, okay, um, NFTs have value again. And so um, people started exploring once again, which is pretty cool to see. All right. And the last thing I touched upon is briefly the metaverse. And now like we can add Facebook here to try to rename itself in the meta. But what is the metaverse? The metaverse is pretty much so uh, virtual worlds online where you can buy and own land, physical assets, launch stores, uh, and the like. So a lot of people right now, there are a couple of big players in the space, um, but a lot of people pre this Facebook, like, cause I don't think Facebook's agenda is quite the same, um, saw these different metaverses. So there's like sandbox, which is what we're showing over here on the left where Snoop Dogg is partnering. And then a lot of different groups have started to, to buy land here. Um, and then on the right is the central land and they just had a festival with uh, Paris Hilton. I went to her mansion, her old mansion, to watch uh, her set in Decentraland <laughs> with a Web3 accelerator, which is quite interesting. Um, and then on the other side, uh, there is um, like this whole uh, community driven thing where the thing that powers this universe here or this metaverse there are NFTs. So NFTs allow you to then purchase land, trade the land. Um, there's a royalty kickback sometimes. So it's really fascinating to see that people can then create a digital or virtual marketplace there. And sort of the thing about the metaverse is like right now it's very early days, but it is still virtual real estate. So it's kind of an interesting thing that's starting to happen. All right. Okay, so that was basically all the stuff and a really quick <laughs> rundown of what the, the market looks like. Um, and so I'm going to just very briefly talk about what I'm doing. Um, so Ships is the startup that I'm launching. Um, that's called, I've been working on for the past year. It's a new way to sustain open source. It's working on building token economics for open source software. And so what does that look like? Well, open source today has a lot of problems. The top sort of problems are that uh, there are very few maintainers of open source. Um, it's not very well funded. And then there's a large sort of leech community that's not really a leech community. They just don't really know how to engage. So a lot of the problems are that uh, contributors contribute to the open source they often don't get that much in return other than the sort of spiritual aspect of uh, contributing. Uh, fans and people uh, tend to donate to these projects, but the only people that can receive that are the core teams. Um, firms pay maybe just the core team for a feature that they like, and then everyone is kind of giving into uh, the open source. So, and then if you look on the flip side of that, lots and lots of consumers of the open source that don't really necessarily add direct value to this uh, little pie here. So the question is, how do we fix the money? How do we fix the economy of like the open source? So if we take all those components we had before <laughs> and we say, hey, why don't we have an open source DAO uh, where we allow the public at large and individuals to uh, sort of contribute. So uh, the orange arrows are tokens. The green arrows are sort of cash flow. You can think of it. So, um, all right. If to become a DAO member, you have to buy tokens. The result of those tokens, uh, that cash flow, flows into the treasury DAO or the DAO treasury. And then 
The Dow Treasury is controlled by the core team and the public at large that brought individual membership into the DAP. So these people, to use the vernacular the, of the times, is they aped in to the open source style. Okay, so this is great. So what do these people get for uh, aping into this? They get access to vote on how the DAO should produce value producing items, uh, how they should spend the money in the treasury, and they get access to uh, be a part of this membership, this social club, and they get access to all the services and goods uh, that are produced by the community um, that accept uh, these tokens. So what can they do with the tokens? They can put these tokens in liquidity pools to provide liquidity for people that are typically consuming. So this 1 million of other firms that are consuming software and services, they can now buy tokens from the market. Um, and then uh, they can use these tokens to pay for goods and services to go back to people. So you end up creating a small economy. So in this case, you are kind of like a small federal reserve or your own currency for this project. So you get to decide like how much, how many tokens you're going to be issuing, whether it's going to happen on daily, whether you have an inflationary economy or you have a fixed deflationary economy, whether or not you have like a burn mechanism uh, where you can literally burn cash as it's deposited to increase the value. You can kind of think about all of the different economic games um, that make sense for that particular ecosystem. So I'm taking this kind of idea and tying things together. So why uh, the DAO? So, and how does that like sort of tie to NFTs and things like that? Well, purchasing an NFT is like purchasing a, a membership into a DAO. Um, people earn rewards for uh, the NFT. There's a finite amount of rewards issued. And then there are royalties on the resale that feed back into the DAO which gives you a treasury to be able to do other things. Is it like big picture? I'm not gonna like dive into this too much, but basically this open source DAO organization has the ability to earn interest on that DAO to feed back into the organization to then uh, invest in uh, values, uh, value producing items for the ecosystem that would then increase the value of the tokens. So. It could be like a lot of organizations are starting to look at buying land in the metaverse. So you can kind of have a REIT where you lease out this land in the metaverse and get uh, like funding for this. And the same for like yield farms. If you have a pool of money, you can put this money in the yield farm. The organization can vote to do that. And then you can gain some yield on all of the interest that you've been collecting. And then Finally, you have the organization of T holders that get access to the software. They can then provide liquidity to the rest of the market through these liquidity pools. And the rest of the market can buy fungible tokens, which gets them access to the software services they're looking for. And so basically what we've done is we've taken open source code and we've instead opened the economy. So if we go back to the beginning here, this small core team that is the only people that could, if you look at where all the green arrows go, could actually economically benefit from the open source outside of these firms. Uh, that new diagram doesn't really look like that. It looks like any one of these players can add value um, by the consumption and building services around the token. And so that's the general premise, uh, building token economies for open source. Okay, tips and tricks. So I'm just like really rifling through this and then we'll do questions. So um, this is more of a thing that you should just get the slide deck for, but um, basically there's a lot of tools for querying the blockchain. There's BigQuery, there's doing analytics. There's these things called IC tools for your NFTs. Rarity tools is another one. Then you've got the exchanges, Binance, Bittrex, Gate, Gate.io. They all have APIs, CoinMarketCap. And then you have swaps and DeFi projects. So you have like MakerDAO, Abracadabra Money, Uniswap, Sushi, PancakeSwap. Uh, and then you've got your yield farms, Curve, Yearn, Compound, Balancer. And then 
sort of this thing that's been happening. So recently there was a hack for $115 million on Kroon Finance. And the way that it worked was through um, flash loans. So flash loans are a radically different idea where imagine that you can take any side of a deal and for let's say a thousand dollars worth of gas, you can say that like, okay, I borrowed $100 million and then I made a deal where I swapped the hundred million dollars for uh, five hundred thousand ETH, and then I made the deal that took that five hundred thousand ETH and brought uh, ten thousand ten million Doge, and then I sold the ten million Doge for uh, for uh, four million dollars. Okay, so a flash loan allows you to make that bet. And a single transaction. And if it doesn't work out, then you just lose a thousand dollars. So, like, basically, what it allows you to do is to mitigate the risk of failure for taking risky loans. Um, and so, if you do find an arbitrage opportunity, then it allows you to take that risk of realizing the arbitrage opportunity. Um, without really taking on the risk. So in traditional finance, if you say, loan me $5 million, there's a possibility that you're not going to like cover your losses. You could like inherit that risk. But with flash loans, there is no like risk. The only risk you lose is that you don't have gas. Um, and the way that it works is that blockchain technology will not allow all of the components of the transaction to go through unless um, they actually work out. So the blockchain itself protects the investor or the savvy uh, person from uh, getting wrecked to, to use the vernacular of, of uh, the ecosystem. <laughs> um, some other things to look at, multiple transactions per transaction. Um, so some of the data in BigQuery will have a bunch of internal transactions. Um, and it could be from people doing flash loans, or it could be from people making multiple deals in a single transaction, which just is a thing that can happen. Pricing data can be harder to determine at a point in time because who has the price? Maybe coin market cap at time 10 is delayed from what someone else says the market is, or what Binance had the price at, or what coin gecko. Somewhere in between there, they're pretty close. I'm not sure what the exact drift is. And then the other thing to always keep in mind is crypto doesn't work like a regulated market uh, where price and future value are immediately reflected. So there are arbitrage opportunities and like people are seeking those out and there is um, misalignment of information. So it's just a different market. Uh, and then systemic risk still exists. Like there is country risks. Like uh, if you invest in North Korea, you are probably going to hit some sort of country risk, <laughs> either from your own country of origin or hitting sanctions. Um, so here's a thing that's really cool. So you can see all of the money that's lost um, through systemic risk. Um, there's this rec news leaderboard, which is pretty good. It talks about all of the different things that like people have tried and how they got wrecked um, to use vernacular. Okay, cool. So I'm going to open up for questions if I'm not completely out of time. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, professor uh, left for a while, but he will be back because he has to get on an, um, another call. So anyone has questions can ask now. I am back. Okay. Oh, awesome. Just talking about you. Good. I was talking about you, Zane, to the other ones, oh, but I'll yeah. let you ask that. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So, oh, actually, the most important slide. <laughs> For those of you that are interested. All right. Hello. Invent the future of token economics for software. I'm like looking for people that are interested. I cannot offer you money at this point in time, but I can offer you tokens and potential money in the future. <laughs> hey, 
This is this is probably the most important slide right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I've got. Uh, I mean, Yeren is working on. Uh, I don't know who you've spoken to. I know Jack is interested. Yer is interested. Kieran is interested. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, Chitalia, are you still there? You just joined. Uh, Ram, Ram, Ramos is working on uh, some blockchain stuff. Uh, so yeah, we're going to put together a um, 